Alexis and Richard, I want to thank you for sharing your story with us and helping all of us understand your situation and the situation of so many families here in Texas. I'd like to ask our panelists to come up and, <clears throat> and I will introduce them to you. To my immediate right and your left, this is Dr. Francis Devinney. And Dr. Francis is the Senior Research Associate for the Center of Public Policy Priorities, who helped put this uh, film together that we just watched. And also, she is the director of Texas Kids Count. And then Richard, <clears throat> and where is Alexis? You're not, you, no, okay. And Richard James, you all have met him uh, in the video we just saw, and they've been living here in San Antonio for about a year. And Kevin Moriarty with uh, the President and CEO of Methodist Healthcare. And so we'd like to open this up for any questions that you might have. Would you all like to begin by making a statement, or do you want to start with taking questions? Um, I can make a little short statement about sure. the film. Right. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you so much for coming out and sharing this film with us tonight. Um, it was a very special project for us at the center, um, not only to get to meet such wonderful, real Texas families like Richard and Alexis, but um, also to be able to put life to a lot of the work that we do at the Center for Public Policy Priorities. The center is very well known for producing some beautiful bar charts and graphs of things that are very important in Texas. But what we really needed was to be able to add a little heart to the story and to really bring truth to those numbers that we had. And so we embarked on something very new for us, which was a film um, that you just saw, Fighting Chance, to really help people understand that when we say we have you know, 1.3 million children living in poverty in Texas, what does that look like? Who are these children that we're talking about? instead of trying to otherize people, to really bring them in to help you understand that they are not dissimilar to you. They have, as you heard in the film, they have all the hopes and dreams that any family would, and their paths are very different. They may have found themselves in a tight economic situation because of a medical issue, or they may have had a job that didn't pay enough, or they may have lost a job. Whatever the situation was, they all found themselves in a place where nobody wants to be, and that's probably the best definition of poverty is that it's somewhere no one wants to be, right? <laughs> and so what we're trying to do is to be able to use these stories to help people understand that the ideals of having a safe family, a healthy family, a secure family is something that we all share together. And um, I'd like to say me and Alexis were privileged to be part of this project. Um, you know, a year and a half ago, we would have been oblivious to who these Texas families are on these pie charts. Um, Beautiful pie charts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I mean, we learned a lot about the, uh, the Medicaid system specifically, you know, trying to get care for our son and trying to survive. And, you know, we're both college students. Um, we'd like to think of ourselves as intelligent people. And I mean, it was a situation that I mean, there's, it doesn't matter who you are. You would have been devastated financially, emotionally. And so uh, it's just good to see our, you know, our son up here making a, a difference and just letting people know that there's people that need these types of programs. And, and I, there's hardly anything I can say after seeing this. Uh, we were happy to join with CP Cube to fund it, to put it together, to help uh, put a face to all of the things that are happening to so many people. Um, and, and as I'll take an opportunity to tell all of you, uh, today, your legislator, uh, your legislature has the opportunity to add a million and a half people to Medicaid. And they're debating it, and it's funded. There's a half a million children that are add-ons, if that gets through, a half a million children and they think there's some sort of decisioning process that they have to go through to accept your tax money back to expand the Medicaid program. And so this insanity that happens in this state so often around issues of taking care of people who are in need just has to stop. Uh, there are just too many people. You know, 
you, you, the statistic of 26% of our state being uninsured translates to 6 million people. And we're not going to insure a million and a half because of politics. It's terrible. Doctor, what are, will you be having? You'll have the mic. Wait, are we going to ask people to come up? We'll take. Okay, we're gonna take the microphone to you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Did, if you have, when you have a question. Well, I, I will start. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Moriarty, what would you recommend people here do to advocate for, advocate for these children? I mean, certainly writing letters and emails, but w what else? to convince the legislature? Well, all of you know your legislators. I mean, in, in Bear County, you don't need to go for the Democrats. You need to find an R. Lyle Larson is an R. He's a nice guy. He's been a county commissioner for a lot of years. You know him, talk to him. He needs to be on the side of this issue going forward. Uh, we just elected uh, uh, Campbell to replace Wentworth. Uh, she's a senator. She's an R. She says, no, we're not going forward with this issue. Somebody needs to call her and say, this is about me and my service. This is something I need. Uh, that needs to be out there uh, immediately uh, this time around. Uh, if it doesn't work this time around, then I would suggest to all of you, uh, you need to be involved in the political process. You need to make your voice heard. You need to have your story out there. You need to get angry about what's happening around you and make it something that drives you every single day. A step of the way. Uh, it's absolutely critical and important that these services be available in our communities. Uh, it's just a terrible tragedy. I spoke to the legislature two weeks ago uh, and gave them the statistic from two reports, one from Harvard, you know, which they discounted, and one from UT Medical Branch in Galveston. One said that 5,000 people would die a year because of lack of services under Medicaid if this expansion wasn't occurring, one said 9,000. Harvard said nine, UTMB Galveston said five. I said, choose, but you can change that to zero by allowing these funds to come in. So you need to think about how it impacts an individual life and put that in front of people's face because it's an extraordinarily serious issue. May I add? Sure. So I think it's really important to remember, too, that the, the sole function of our elected officials is to make sure that we each have the opportunity to reach our fullest potential, right? That's why we send them there, is to create a Texas, to create an environment that allows each of us to reach our opportunities that are in front of us, right? And so I think a lot of times people forget that, that that's their job, that's what they're supposed to be there to do, and they get kind of freaked out by the suits in the big stone building, okay? But I promise you, all of the people who are elected, you know, they're try they really are trying to do what they think that their um, constituents want them to do. They think that because that's who they're hearing from. If they don't hear from people saying, what are you doing? Why are you not making choices that represent me? I live in your district. They're going to keep doing what they think people want them to do. And I'll tell you this too. These are also real people. They have to take their cats to the vet. They have tires that blow out on their cars. They have arguments with their teenagers. They are real people and they're not as intimidating as they seem. And s furthermore, the people who answer the phones are probably 22-year-old interns who work there from the university. So, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with being 22 years old, but I'm just saying it, it's not as intimidating as it would seem, and it's a simple phone call. And what I used to work in the legislature, and we assumed that for every phone call we got, it was representing the opinion of 100 people. So that's a really, really powerful 30-second phone call that you can make to the Capitol, and it makes a really big difference, particularly in these last days when they're debating such really important issues around Medicaid expansion. We're also looking at trying to get universal breakfast to all schools who have children, about 80% of their kids or more um, who are eligible for free and reduced price lunch. They're just gonna say, ah, go ahead and give breakfast to everybody, and it's fully federally funded. We don't have to put any money toward that from the state, and they're debating it. It's moving. It's moving in the right direction. But so we have programs like that. We're talking about payday lending. 
and that's gotten very bogged down in a lot of the political process. Are you guys familiar with kind of check cashing places and payday lenders and all that? So that's another big step that we can make in Texas to really protect families who maybe don't feel like they have the same kind of financial options that a lot of families do. They are, they are not comfortable with banks or they don't understand the financial situation. And yet, one of these very simple things that we can do to help protect families is getting kind of bogged down. So again, I just repeat what Kevin said, and, and it's, it sounds so simple and it sounds innocuous, but I think really making that call makes a really huge difference, and I can't stress that enough. And they, and they do read those, and you think, what does one voice, what does one email, what does one letter mean? But as Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Davini just said, um, it represents 100 people. And I know from being inside the political process myself, when you get 100 phone calls, they start paying attention. They really well, start Well, success attention. did happen. I'd, I'd point out Marion Sokol here. Marion, stand up for a minute. Come on, Marion. You can do it. <laughs> Marion spearheaded the effort on the CHIP Children's Health Insurance Program for the state of Texas 10 years ago? when Governor Bush was the governor, mm -hmm. and Governor Bush at the time said, Texas was not gonna accept that program except at 75% of poverty, and the advocates said 125%. I wanted 200%, you recall. I didn't get my way. I agreed with the, the advocacy group. We went for 125, and in six months, a no was turned to a yes because of all the children's advocates to say, oh, come on, the children's health insurance program, we're not gonna accept it in Texas. I mean, somebody told him he wasn't electable as the president if he had a state that was taking care of children at 75% of poverty. How, how terrible is that? What image is that? And it changed. <laughs> Two weeks ago, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I went to Austin with the nuns on the bus with Sister Simone Campbell. And we brought 500 letters signed to the governor. We visited all of our legislators on this issue. What we were told over and over again is, even if they pass it, the governor is going to veto it. I came home and I said, 500 letters is only a drop in the bucket. We need 50,000 letters. And so I want to ask everybody here, get everyone you can to write to the governor and tell him we need this bill passed. Um, and you know, all of the legislators that I went to said that they would support it. I probably didn't go to any of the hard ones. <laughs> but they did say they would support it, but I know that there were some who said no. But what they were saying to us, you have to get to the governor because he's going to veto it. I saw a hand up over here. Did someone have a, oh, right there. Yes. Um, I don't know if this is a question you all can answer, but so often um, we have these things and we're singing to the choir and um, so when I see that film, you know, my heart breaks for all of the families. I, I think about this constantly in just my daily life. But I know that there are really good Texans that I meet, and they're friends of mine, and they don't feel the same way. And I'm not sure they'd even view this film in the way that I view it. Um, so I'm just curious to know what it will take to help them to understand that these things are important because they don't want their tax money going to these things. They, they're not thinking about it the way that we're talking about it. So I would just be interested in hearing a good argument that I can make or, or share with some of those individuals. Well, I'm not really sure I have like the brilliant argument um, to, to make, um, but we're working on it. But what I would say is our ultimate goal, um, and this is gonna sound lofty at first, but give me a moment. Our, our ultimate goal is really to help people understand that we're all in this together. As we say in the film, it's, you know, every family could be in this situation. And as Richard eloquently said earlier, you know, 
there's hardly any family that could handle a 1.5, $1.6 million medical bill, right? And so our goal at the center is to really push the message forward and to use this film to talk about that we are all part of a very large community. Now, that sounds, you know, kumbaya and touchy-feely, and, right? So we're actually taking it to um, the business community. So we've been doing a lot of outreach. Um, we don't want to forget our choir. We like our choir. We want to give support to our choir. But we also have been doing outreach to some non-traditional audiences for us. And so we've been reaching out pretty heavily to the business community, to bankers, to um, a lot of the influential people in the state. And what we're finding is that they actually do view the film in the same way that you and I might view the film. And they actually do, um, you know, really identify. When you see flesh and blood, you identify with the people in front of you. And so we're using that as a point of departure to say, okay, once we open the heart, how can we find that kind of common place um, on the table when we're talking about brass tacks? And so we are actually going to be culminating this um, series of roadshow presentations of the film and talking about some of our other data with a summit in April of 2014 about family economic security. Um, and we will, you know, let you all know about that. We're going to be having it in Austin. Um, I don't have any more details yet, but that, that is the plan, is in April. And our intention is to bring together not only the choir, but to bring together business folks, to bring together um, small business owners, to bring together bankers, so that we can develop a common and shared um, legislative agenda for 2015 moving forward to talk about how we can strengthen families' economic security. So I'm not sure that answered your question, but I talked a long time, so maybe it kind of like made you feel nurtured. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have something on that. Um, something I've noticed is people support programs that benefit them or that they can relate to. And, uh, you know, I've had friends that have put things on, you know, Facebook or social media or they'll, you know, talking in just conversation and, you know, they'll be against, you know, Medicaid expansion or, you know, a whole variety of topics, but then the things that they can benefit from, they're for those programs. And so um, I think it does go a lot with just putting a face to it, you know, okay, well, I can physically see how this is benefiting somebody else. Um, but I think otherwise it's just a hard, it's a hard thing to comprehend. People can, it's easy to say my tax money is going to helping somebody that's poor and doesn't want to take care of their family. And that's not the case, you know. I would say, you probably knew the statistics, but 99% of the time I'm sure that's not mm -hmm. the case. And so I think just things like this that show these are real families, these are real people, I think that, that does help. Uh, I, I agree with Richard completely. However, if you want the, the elevator statement, the zinger, uh, the zinger is this, the, the economic report that's been put out by both Perryman and uh, Hamilton and several others, n nobody's non-controvertible report. Everybody in here that pays insurance premium, your premium is $1,600 more because the Medicaid expansion program is not happening in Texas, okay? Every, every one of your friends that doesn't want to pay taxes is paying $1,600 more. Our hospital district has said, if you're a property owner, your property taxes are 20% higher and would go down. So if you want the elevator speech, just on the, you know, you're a conservative person and you don't like paying taxes, well, here are two taxes. You're paying $1,600 or more per, per year for that premium forever until it goes away, and your property taxes are going up forever unless this happens, and it's coming out of your pocket. Now, if you don't want to do it for any other reason, and we are in a theological place, and, you know, we all do believe in life after death, and there is an accountability for our actions, you know, you can go down that path as far as I'm concerned as well. You know, it works with the elderly. They're kind of closer to death. Uh, you know, <laughs> I... I, I use, I mean, seriously, I, I speak to very conservative groups of church people. And the first thing about it is, well, why should I be paying for Medicaid for some child? I said, well, why should I be paying a, for a heart transplant for you at 85? I mean, and, and let's talk about the, you know, and when I say that, they look at me shocked. And I said, well, wouldn't you rather they'll be paying for services for your grandchild? 
And every single elderly person, I, you know, they know I'm joking, and I get a laugh. And I say, well, Medicaid is about your grandchildren, some grandchild, somebody's grandchild, okay? Your child as an adult, your disabled child. And they, they transition to that thinking if you go hard at them in that fashion. But you have to be unpopular. If you want to be popular, don't take on this issue. If you want to be invited back to that, by that person, don't you know, talk. But after the first drink, you know, throw it at him and don't stop. Okay? I'm serious. You know, jump on it with two feet. I mean, if, if you can't take it on in that manner, then you're not serious about understanding what it means. And if you are serious about understanding what it means, then you have the perfect right to stand on that ground and not back down. You're going to fight at your family reunions anyway. Why not do it about something really, really important? <laughs> Yes, in the back of the room. I got one over here. No. Kathleen, right there. Hi, I'm Sister Susan Mika, and uh, thank you very much for all of your work on uh, the, these issues and for the stories. I think that they touch us, you know, at a very deep level and motivate us uh, to keep going and to continue, you know, very hard work. Because uh, I work with the Socially Responsible Investment Coalition, and we're talking to corporations all the time about their practices. And it's very hard, but we don't give up either. You know, we make a little step forward and one back and one to the side and that type of thing. And I mean, I think that this is the same thing in a, in a way because you're saying there's a lot of support out there for this but where is that support chambers of commerce I mean the hospital systems you know the nuns of course when we went but I mean you know like come on how can we maybe have a broader alliance or how can we be reaching out and supporting each other's efforts you know Francis you're saying that like one phone call is worth a hundred other people what's a letter worth about a hundred other people. Well, you know, when we're looking at this, I mean, you know, we just got to keep flooding those offices with our thoughts because, I mean, you, you know, sometimes legislators make a change of heart for just a few calls because they don't get that many maybe on a certain topic. Now, on this, I know they're getting a lot of, a lot of calls because a lot of people are organizing, but I, I just feel like we have to keep at it uh, and I know, like, you know, your boss, Scott, was saying, too, if we don't get it, we need to get it now. But if we don't get it now, we don't give up. We keep working on it. There's, you know, possibility of a special session. There's, you know, on and on and on. I mean, to me, that's what, that's what we have to keep that hope up and keep moving along and see, well, what else can we do together? Because, yes, you are talking to the choir here, but we talk to a lot of other people, and how can we mobilize, maybe is a better word or something, a, a, a lot of the people that are out there. And I'll just add to what Sister Susan said, which is, can you imagine Texas being the only state without Medicare? Can you imagine Texas being the only state without the Children's Health Insurance Program? It will break at some point, like, right, we will break this wall down at some point, but the speed with which we get there depends on how hard we keep hitting at the wall. We will not be the only state in the country that doesn't have Medicaid expansion or doesn't have, you know, I mean, eventually we will get there, but how fast we get there depends on how hard we keep hitting it. Now, I will add, too, that, you know, we assumed the same kind of ratio, one call, 100 people, one letter, 100 people, but because people don't write letters anymore, you get a flood of letters, a giant box of letters in the legislator's office, and it's really annoying because they're not used to it, right? They're like, what am I going to do with all this paper? My gosh. And so it makes a, more of an emotional and a visual impact, but it's harder to get. So, you know, an email goes down the list in your inbox, and you kind of disappears. And, and so, but it's helpful. You can still do that. But a letter, man, it's like touchable, and you see it, and it's there. And if you can get a big giant pile of them, it makes a huge impact. We were in the governor's uh, meeting with his staff, and I was sitting there counting these letters. And I mean, the staff was huge. So, and the staff person was just kind of looking like, oh my gosh. So, you're right. Um, all right, I just had two things real quick. Uh, first, Richard, how are you doing? Uh, we're doing? We're doing good. We're doing good. We came up on our, what would have been our son's year birthday. And so, but we're doing well. We're doing well. Thank you for asking. 
And um, in terms of advocacy, um, everyone here agrees advocacy is great. So just uh, pure logistics, you want to do something, you have a bridge group, you have spurs. Where should someone who's here right now go specifically um, to advocate for the expansion? Well, somebody your age ought to be out on his Twitter account, his Facebook account, his Google account, his email, and everything else. And if you can do a, a ganga, ganja man dance thing associated with Medicaid and go, and go, and go viral with a million hits, then, then I mean, I'm serious. Uh, your generation has the ability to figure out a different way, okay? And if you can figure out a different way and it gets out there, then you're getting somebody to think, okay? All I'm asking legislators to do is think. Someone asked all the conservatives on board this last weekend, Texas Association of Businesses voted in favor of the Zawas bill, and they've now told as of today, I'm looking to my staff, Sandra, as of today, the most conservative Republic-oriented business group of large businesses in Texas have said, pass the damn thing and stop debating it. So it's not just the advocates for folk because it's the right thing to do. The business community has said, do it. Oh, why? Elevator speech. Every business in Texas that doesn't comply with this cumulatively will hit a 200 to $300 million fine per year that they'll be paying because they're not part of this. And so, because of the way that the funding is and how you're subsidized at a certain rate. And they know it, they figured it out. They said, that, well, they don't need that additional cost to them. And so all the pieces that are out there is moving people. Now, you said, well, the governor's gonna veto the bill, right? Well, Zawas is a Republican anesthesiologist, chair of the committee out of Houston, and he's the, he is the supporter of the bill. And the bill is a privatization bill, okay? That's what it is. It's a Medicaid privatization. But as far as I'm concerned, if I can get Blue Cross Blue, Blue Shield rates for Medicaid, so what? As long as a million, 500,000 people get covered, all right? I, mean, I don't care who gets the admin money. I don't care who takes the 15% admin on it. It happens to be a half a billion dollars a year, which is what they're arguing about. Who gets the profit, okay? I don't care if it goes into the private sector. I want the program. And so I think all the advocates need to say, get something done. You know, we'll tweak it, we'll figure out what doesn't work down the line and make it happen, but that's what needs to occur. Um, I would say right now you should call the cap, just there's a main, and I'm sorry I don't have it in front of me, but there's a main capital telephone line, and if you call that and you tell them like where you live, they will tell you who is your legislator, and you can call directly, then it's pretty easy. It'll take a couple of minutes. And, I, okay. I actually helped organize the Nuns on the Bus event that was two weeks ago, um, so if anyone wants to, and if it's okay with you all, uh, if they can come to me afterwards, I can get them those numbers. Awesome. I have all of them available. Good. Excellent, excellent. And then after the session, call them again yeah. and tell them how like, happy or disappointed you are in what happened. Yeah. And then six months down the road, call them again because yeah. an election's coming up. <laughs> yeah, I, get, I get crank calls occasionally. You know, you're welcome to call them every 10 minutes. You know, if you got the time, if it's toll free, make 100 calls. Then you know, maybe somebody will figure out it's coming from one number. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> My, my wife is sitting there with a, with a microphone, so. To challenge you, Mr. Moriarty, to a ganja man video, <laughs> since I know you're fully capable of tweeting uh, and doing all of that. That hip replacement a couple of years ago, can't do it. <laughs> it was a good thing you had good insurance. Uh, to Don's point, I, I really do think, I, you know, I am part of the choir, but I also work for a bank. So I work with a lot of very conservative bankers, and they just don't understand the business case for it. And so I think a lot of us need to be, I think we all are very sympathetic to families in need in the least served, but I don't think we're being well armed with the information to refute the jibber jabber that they're hearing from the very, very conservative far right. And so I think the more information we have on that, the more helpful it will be, because I think we're all sympathetic. I think our hearts break for, for you and your husband. Um, but it's the business case that we need to hear more of. Well, what we actually originally intended this film to be um, paired with, and it is in many cases, is our family budgets work. So if you go to familybudgets.org, um, it's a new um, uh, interactive tool that we have online where you can actually go and you look up, you can pull up San Antonio, and you say, okay, and then I want to see, let's, let's create a family and say, we want it to be a family who receives health insurance through their employer. And it's a two-parent, two-child family, and right now they're not saving for anything. And once you make all those choices, it automatically fills in what that family would need to make in order to make ends meet in San Antonio, New Braunfels 
area. And if you fill all that in, a two-parent, two-child family needs to make $39,000 a year for those two parents together. And that's with, and that's, you know, a considerable amount of money for many families. And so um, what we find is that when you actually change it to be a single parent in particular, then they, they only have to make $34,000 a year, but it's like $17 an hour for a single parent. $17 an hour. That is a really high wage. And so a lot of times when we're talking to business people, not only do we talk about kind of the bigger business numbers about um, kind of the impact on their, on their particular business in terms of um, fines, but also on the individual families, how you're having to pay more for your health insurance premiums. But we also talk about their workers. And so we say, can you afford to pay your workers $17 an hour to make ends meet? And they're like, no, I can't afford it. Well, it's like, that's right. But do you think that they should be healthy enough to come to work? Yes. Do you want them to be healthy enough to come to work? Yeah. We do. And do you want them to be able to save so their kid can go to college? Well, yeah, we do. So what do we need to put in place to be able to make sure that that happens? If you can't afford to pay them in that much, but you think they need to be healthy, how are we going to get that done? And you kind of lead them down the path. And you actually get them to talking about what are the options. Because as a small business owner, let's say, I, they can't afford health insurance for their employees because it's just they're getting priced out of the market just like individual families are. And say, we understand that you're struggling with that. Families are struggling with that too. What do we need to have in place to be able to make sure that they can be healthy enough to get to your job every day? And that's kind of that's kind of some of the conversation that we're having. But we add in all those other business points too that your husband eloquently laid out for us. So yeah. Yes, sir. So we um, are currently engaging in what we're calling the um, Road to a Better Texas. So it's a road show where we're doing a lot of um, meetings like this, but not only with our choir groups, but also with um, business organizations and trying to reach um, um, a whole varied, you know, um, list with meeting with chambers and meeting with um, elected officials. Um, and right now we've already taken this around to, um, we've had about 20 different presentations reaching about 2,000 people. And um, it has played on um, Austin's PBS station several times. It has played on, help me out, Alexa. It's played on um, Amarillo, Corpus Christi, Fort Worth, um, Alaska. <laughs> it's actually played on Alaska's PB, PBS station uh, and New Orleans. New Orleans and, uh, oh, somewhere on the East Coast. And yeah, so we've gotten several PBS stations to play it multiple times on their stations. We also have it on our YouTube station as well. And we've been giving out, and we actually have copies of the DVD. We have a few copies of the DVD with us um, tonight, and so we're giving it out for people to play. And what we're finding is it's, it's kind of um, going a little bit viral where people are like taking the DVDs and playing them in for their boards. Um, they're, and they're playing them for their meetings that they're holding, and um, where we're not even there. So. Um, it's actually um, going well in terms of getting the message out. What we really hope is that this is not just going to be kind of a feel good for the choir, but it's actually going to bring people together in this summit in April to really start making an actual um, point by point plan that we can all sign on together where we get businesses and activists and advocates um, together to sign on to a legislative agenda for 2015. I am so sorry to not have mentioned that. Of course, we actually do have the faith community involved. Methodist Healthcare Ministries actually funded um, uh, funded uh, the film with us, and so we actually do actively have the faith community involved. And that is my bad for not mentioning that. That is an excellent idea. Can you get me in? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. I will talk to you after. And I'm serious about that. I'm not being sassy. I mean, <laughs> that would be great. I'm fine with sassy. Okay. Excellent. You'll you'll like me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Mo most of you won't see this, but starting Wednesday, uh, we're going to release uh, three vignettes, less than a minute, uh, in very conservative markets in North and Central Texas, that basically say, what if. Texas were to have a Medicaid program profiling children, families, and others. Um, and we're paying for the media so we can get in prime time, and then the media stations are going to give us 
additional media because we are a nonprofit. But we're buying the media because we want to be in prime time in those communities with a strategy to have those communities call in. And again, we're targeting the communities of the committee members that are going to make the decision on this issue. And we're starting that Wednesday. I'm going to run it through the end of the month. The legislature ends on the 27th of May. And so again, uh, I've been on a lot of these issues before, and it typically takes, you know, Texas is a pretty slow state, so it's, it's at least two sessions before they get it. Uh, so we may have to be a, a session away. But we've told the legislature, we're not going away. I mean, we've reminded them that we've been on these issues before, and we're not going anywhere except back. Um, and we are going to, I mean, I'll do a report uh, with uh, Dr. Brody or the Harvard report that uh, annotates the 9,000 deaths per year by county, by rep, and start doing publicity on that. You're killing people. It's 9,000 a year, so if it takes two years, that's 18,000 deaths. And you will figure out where they are. Again, something has to happen to get people to understand this is pain and suffering. I, my staff and I see it. I mean, we, we, are, we fund the charity care. We fund the interventions. We have the individuals walking in the door with cancer and tertiary stage, and we're doing the tumor removals with people that are going to die. And we see them, our doctors, our nurses, our staff. And it's avoidable. It's absolutely avoidable, and that's what's driving us to get this done. That's what the healthcare industry sees, the avoidability of all of this pain and suffering. And Richard, would you share with us your, your experience with the system? So, um, as you saw in the video, we at first were a little naive to the system, and we, we understood that our son was going to have some pre-existing conditions, and we knew that that meant uh, we wouldn't be able to get his, our own insurance. However, Alexis was on private insurance under her father, and uh, we were just under the misconception that he would have continuous coverage from there. Um, quickly, we realized that that wasn't the case. Um, within hours, we had representatives from the hospital you know, we need to get these Medicaid applications, we need to get these things filled out. Um, one of the things that was startling about the actual application itself is it's not, it doesn't look at what you need, it looks at what you have. And so, uh, you know, we had some money in savings, we were both college students, we both had, you know, pretty, pretty nice cars still, um, very low paying jobs, we're just still college students. And so, uh, what we had initially disqualified us from any kind of benefits. And so we had to, you know, we had to do things. We had to give um, one of our vehicles to her mother so that that wouldn't be counted. I mean, the, uh, the cost of, of our son's care was staggering. I mean, in the millions of dollars. And uh, they're looking at our, you know, measly three thousand dollars in savings as something to disqualify us, and it was eye-opening. It was just eye-opening, and uh, you know, we got through it. But I mean, it was. If it wasn't for, if it wasn't for Medicaid and receiving that help and getting the best care, because we had some of the best care that we could. We actually moved to San Antonio for his care because we were living in Lubbock, and so we completely had to relocate. And I don't think people realize that either, that, I mean, this is your child, so you're going to just completely change your whole life. And we did. And so... We wouldn't have had six months with our son if it wasn't for the health care and able to get Medicaid. And I mean, I think it was like four million dollars by the end of it. And we wouldn't have had four million dollars to keep providing our son health care. So he would have been in that statistic and we wouldn't have had to. This doesn't seem quite to fit now because we mm -hmm. this question about the faith-based community but there is a church in Dallas who's developed this app and a, a local church CBC has just an app and if, if we could if we could get the churches to put a link from their app 
their phone app either the film or you know <laughs> the elevator I mean the church that has it in town has 23,000 who came at Easter 23,000 who watch on TV I mean watch on so that's those are those are pretty big numbers and I know the church in Dallas who who has you know, that same capability, you know, if we could approach them and we could even get, you know, so, minimum. So, so Dominica, stand up. <laughs> okay. Dominica is of, of the appropriate age to know about apps, social media, Twitter, etc. You You tell her the app, she'll figure out how to link it. Okay. Right? Tomorrow, right? One, two, three. It's easy to link. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can tell you what our church app is, but I don't know the guy in, in Dallas who developed this, and now ch churches at least can can pay for for this this application. And I, th you know, I mean, CBC's got a lot of people in it, and they only pay ten thousand dollars. Okay, <clears throat> or maybe it was more. Don't quote that. <laughs> But I think this is the kind of conversation that we need to not only have in this room, but we need to have out in the communities and not be afraid to have out in the communities and try to be in this, that exact kind of creative thinking about how do we get the message out there about what Texas children and families need. We can't just do it when we feel comfortable in a room together. We have to be able to have those difficult and creative conversations out in the world as well. And I love your creative ideas, so please, please come share them with us. Well, and, and I would end, end on a, a different note, and that's this. Um, and you can go out to our website, mhm.org, and go to our quick links and download a report called Do This and You Shall Live. I think it's still there, right? And we did that report so that we could follow every single faith's agenda on taking care of the unfunded and the least served. And so regardless of whether you're Episcopal, Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, or Muslim, it doesn't matter. Your faith traditions compel you to do the right thing for people. And so the reporters do this and you shall live. You don't need to know the numbers. You don't need to know Medicaid. You don't need to know about food stamps. Our faith traditions tell us all that we need to do these things because it's the right thing to do. And so that's, you know, take that book with you. And you don't need to know the data. You don't need to know the numbers. You just need to say, you know, what faith are you? You're on page nine. Here, read it. <laughs> I mean, we, we did the same thing on children's issues. We, did, we had every faith leaders sign an encyclical on children's health care. Why? The, the Catholic bishop's letter, the Lutheran letter, every single letter of every one of the denominations on a national level said, we need to do these things for children. Well, then if I'm meeting with an Episcopal, a Baptist, a Catholic legislator, I don't need to talk about whether he's an R or a D. I ask him if he goes to church. <laughs> and I said, by the way, why aren't you doing this because you go to church? That's what it says. I've asked the leaders of every denomination to talk to their legislators in their uh, place when they're at church. Why not? That's what you. That's the space you own. At least 40. <laughs> At least 40. Yeah. Four score and 10, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you all so very much. I mean, we have nearly 100 people here. Everybody makes a call or a letter, that's 10,000. And then just going out to reach to four or five of your friends and getting them to do that, that's 50,000 that you want to deliver to the governor. So there's a lot of power in this room, a lot of power in this room. And it doesn't take a whole lot of effort. 
but thank you all very much. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. I want to call you Dr. Francis instead of Vinny at that one time. <laughs> yes, thank you. That was really great. Fine. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate you being here. Yeah. It's time to do this. Thank you. Just enlighten me. <laughs>